back. I'm back. How's everyone doing? Uh, remember, I, while I'd rather have you here, uh, do enjoy all parts of the festival. There's a little piano music downstairs every day, both days till 4.30, I think. Um, and of course, great music around. Also, uh, a reminder that um, the Sashmo Summerfest, uh, you are an important part uh, of it by um, buying uh, merchandise and drinks. And one of the good part for it being so hot out is that, you know, you're thirsty. It's like, you know, a free lunch. You know, it's salty, so you'll buy more drinks. Well, the heat will make you buy more drinks. Um, so I hope you do that. Um, uh, this is, oh, uh, well, Stephen's not here. He likes it when I say, this is the penultimate uh, portion of the, today's program, which is a fancy way to say next to last. Uh, you find yourself at the 23rd annual Sashmo Summerfest at the uh, Sashmo Legacy Stage in memory of Joni Barry. Uh, this year, the Sashmo Summerfest uh, is presented by the New Orleans Tourism and Cultural Fund. Um, this particular stage is supported by the Joseph K. and Inez Eichenbaum Foundation, uh, which uh, Stephen Maitland Lewis, you might have seen him here earlier, uh, and his uh, late wife, uh, who the stage is dedicated to, uh, Joni Berry. If you have a chance, she's had an interesting life. There's a little uh, capsule biography here. She danced with Donald O'Connor, the last great vaudevillian in my view. Um, and uh, also the Ella Fitzgerald Charitable Foundation and Richard and Vicki Norigian who are watching from Maui, New Jersey. Um, so, as I mentioned, if you were here at the end of the last presentation, uh, this, uh, uh, we are now at the portion of the program where we have Sam Irwin talking about Louis Armstrong and the 4th of July. And it's kind of larger than that, but that is kind of the center of it. Um, uh, um, Sam is a trumpeter and front man of the Florida Street Blowhards, a traditional jazz band in Baton Rouge. Um, he uh, former press secretary of the Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry, presently the head of PR for the American Sugarcane League. Um, they have some good teams in that league. Yeah. Uh, the Havana Sugar Kings. No. Um, uh, he's the author of uh, three books. That's right. Uh, one is called uh, It Happens in Louisiana, um, uh, which is kind of oddball food and folkways from yeah. what I read about it. Um, and then also uh, award uh, critically acclaimed Louisiana Crawfish, a succulent history of the Cajun crustacean. Uh, and most recently, uh, and f from, uh, from which this presentation derives, is Hidden History of Louisiana's Jazz Age. This is adapted, I believe, from the chapter Born on the 4th of July. Um, and you'll note, because he's everywhere, forward by Ricky Riccardi. Uh, of this book. So, um, is this your first time here? Um, uh, this is my second time. I, I spoke on the Crawfish book back in 2014. Ah. To popular acclaim, I might oh, the, uh, Very good. So, so give him another warm welcome, Mr. Sam Irwin. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Uh, this is what the book looks like. It, this is a commercial, and I talk about the 4th of July birthday, which is what I'm going to talk about today. But it's got all these other things in there. It's got murder, sex, violence, shooting, all kinds of stuff. The book is downstairs in the gift shop. So if you buy one and you happen to see me, I'll be happy to sign it for you. It doesn't add to the value, but it doesn't detract from the value either. <laughs> all right, so uh, we're going to talk about Louis Armstrong's and why he might have chosen the 4th of July as his birthday. and. Well, you know, Ricky played some uh, music, so I got a little bit of music here. All right, I might add that Ricky Riccardi is, is I, I love him. I buy all of his books. He helped me a whole, much, a whole bunch with this uh, with this book, and I'm indebted to him for writing this chapter. 
but did he get his picture in Gambit magazine yesterday? No, this is a picture of my band. And anyway, I already showed him that, and he got a kick out of that. All right, so thank you all for coming. Um, um, the, crit the, um, the controversy is that Louis Armstrong said his birthday was July 4th. And sometimes he would say and write it down as July 4th, 1900, and other times he would say 1901. Well, um, anyway, a baptismal record was found years after his death. That's a picture of the baptismal record and that sacred heart of Jesus Catholic Church, which is located at 3200 Canal Street, which is not far from here, and it's pretty close to where Louis Armstrong was born in, on Jane Alley. Uh, Louis Armstrong, um, he, of course, he, we, we see that he appeared on a lot of TV shows, and he was on the Dick Cavett show in 1970. And I think Dick, Ca Dick Cavett, if you go back and find this clip, which you can, I think Dick Cavett tried to trip him up, and he, he asked him when his birthday was, and Pop said, 1900, midnight. And, and, and Dick Cavett, well, what do you mean? You mean f midnight at uh, the 4th? And, and Lewis turned the tables on him and got a big laugh and said, oh, I didn't ask Mama about all that. I didn't want to interfere in her business. And that got a big laugh. So uh, anyway, um, Armstrong at this time in 1970, obviously he's very aware of the civil rights movement and of prejudice, and the two songs that he chose to play on, on the Dick Cavett show was Someday You'll Be Sorry and You Rascal You. Uh, if you don't know the lyrics to You Rascal You, they are I'll be glad when you're dead, you rascal you. Uh, so the reason why I bring it up, if you, if you bring up if you look at it through the eyes of political science, scientist James Scott's concept of hidden transcripts, the hidden transcripts theory means it's a way to examine the, di the dynamics of power and resistance. And it refers, to form, it refers to forms of resistance and dissent that are kept out of sight for those in power. Now, Scott developed this theory not by studying American slavery but of the South, but the Peasant Society of Southeast Asia in the 1970s. And so we all know what happened there. This, the Southeast Asian peasants, the, the Vietnamese, they pretty much uh, thwarted our uh, uh, attempts to win their hearts and minds. So you think of it as Scott's concept can be seen in United States slave society. Slaves might behave obediently and submissively in the presence of the slave master, but they develop elaborate tactics of subversion to slow the pace of work, or they pretended to be less intelligent or capable and hence potentially dangerous, but behaved entirely different within the community of slaves. These tactics, you know, what Scott called the weapons of the weak, were well understood in the submissive group. So Lewis, if you think of, if you think of Lewis, uh, uh, he's, he's sharp. He knows what's going on. He knows how America is. He knows there's prejudice. He knows that there's uh, discrimination. He's encountered it his whole life. But the interpretation of these two songs, why did he choose these two songs? That this was a national audience. It could be con con construed as a hidden transcript that he was communicating to a knowing audience. I mean, You Rascal You, I'll Be Glad When You're Dead, You Rascal You, is a funny song about marital infidelity, and Someday You'll, so you'll Be Sorry is a song about bad, a bad romance, but it could mean something entirely different if you think of it in, with the concept of hidden of hidden transcripts. So I, I think Pop was a lot deeper, as Maxine said earlier, he was a lot deeper. He knew what was going on, and I think I could, well, I'm putting forth the supposition that he was transmitting messages 
or was he? But I'm going to attempt to prove that to you. I bring up the concept because Pops was a brilliant and talented man. He navigated his way out of poverty, despite prejudice and Jim Crow, into a successful career as a musician, actor, entertainer, a pop star who defied classification. But he knew how things were in the United States, and he did what he could to change it. So the first time Pops is asked to write down his uh, date of birth is when he registered for the draft. And you can kind of see uh, the, he might have put down 18-something, and he scratched it out to write 1900. And he wrote down 1900 July 4th. And so there was uh, an author and a music critic named Gary Giddens who wrote a, a pretty good book about Louis Armstrong in 1988 called Satchmo, the Genius of Louis Armstrong. And he suggested that Louis wrote 1900 to appear older and to possibly provide proof that he was old enough to perform in the bars and nightclubs in New Orleans. But why July 4th? All right, July 4th. Uh, Gary Giddens, in his book, explains a way that, by suggesting Lewis chose Independence Day because it was customary, this is a quote, customary for boys who didn't know their birthday to choose the 4th of July. Now, when you study history, and, and if you're a history major like I am, there's a, this awful class that you have to take. It's called historiography, and it's the study of the writing of history. So my historiography teacher said, hmm, well that, that sounds true, but is it true? Do you have the facts to back it up? Did, were people choosing the 4th of July as their birthday because they didn't, they didn't have any education? They, they, um, so when, when Tad Jones, who was a researcher here in New Orleans, and he was working for Gary Giddens, he's the one that found out the baptismal record and the news got out, well, Bruce Egler of the Times-Picayune wrote the same thing in his article in 1989, Armstrong, give or take a year. For a poor and ill-educated black man not to know his birthday was common in those days, and scholars figured that Armstrong simply barred the nation's birthday for his own. He apparently had no birthday celebrations of his own. And then, in a later book, in 1997, author Lawrence Pegreen wrote a book called Louis Armstrong, An Extravagant Life. That was the first book I read on Louis Armstrong's biography. Uh, he wrote the same thing. It was custom for poor blacks to an, uh, adopt an honorary date as their birthday, often Christmas or New Year's or the 4th of July. All right, that all sounds plausible, but is it fact? To me, these statements fail to grasp what Independence Day meant to the new citizens created by the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution and their immediate descendants. If we've had, what, 400 years of slavery, and now we've got a whole four million freedmen who are suddenly granted citizenship. The 4th of July, inalienable rights. To have, that, to have that bestowed upon you by an act of law, the 4th of July, Independence Day, must have meant something different to those people than what we think of the 4th of July today. So that all sounds what Stephen Colbert calls truthiness. Okay, so uh, I have a, a moment of a a, a wrong presupposition last week, my band, we just started playing the song Ice Cream. You know, ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream, rock, rock my baby, rock. Well, anyway, I look at the lyric sheet, and guess who wrote it? Howard Johnson. Oh, so it's so perfect. Howard Johnson wrote the song Ice Cream. You know, for 28 flavors. Isn't that amazing? But it turned out it wasn't the right Howard Johnson. It wasn't Howard Johnson of the ice cream. Besides, we all know Howard Johnson was born in Rockridge. 
We ter it turns out Mel Brooks is not a good, reliable source of information either. So anyway, so let's explore the 4th of July and what it meant to uh, black people in 1900 and all of that. Now, on the other hand, Gary Giddens did suggest that Pops may have chosen Independence Day for its patriotic ring. So let's examine what patriotism was to black New Orleans in the last half of the 19th century. So in Louis Armstrong's biography, he said the 4th of July was a big holiday in New Orleans. He wasn't talking about the white celebration. He was talking about the celebration of blacks in New Orleans on the 4th of July. So this man is Frederick Douglass. He was, you probably heard about him in your history class. He was an abolitionist. And um, you know, if you just basically take uh, uh, your American history class in high school and you might be required to take it in your college class, that's about all of, um, you'll hear about Frederick Douglass. But he wrote a speech that he delivered in 1852. It was called, What to the American Slave is Your Fourth of July? Now that wasn't taught in my hometown in Brobridge in 1968. And it wasn't taught in Louisiana history. And it wasn't taught in my American history class in 1972 in Brobridge. Now my friend Kathy Hambrick, who is the founder of the River Road African American Mu Museum, she's a little bit younger than I am, and she graduated in 1975, and she said they taught it at her high school in Donaldsonville, East Ascension High School. Donaldsonville, as you know, is where Joe King Oliver is from. She said they taught it in her school, but the black kids had to stage a protest to get it taught in the class. So if you don't know the Douglas speech, here it is. What to the slave is the 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals to him more than any of the other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty, an unholy license. Your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him the slave. Mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. Oh, I forgot to put the disclaimer when I started the speech. Uh, warning, this lecture has critical race theory. <laughs> so, you know, you can leave if, you, if you're not, if you, you don't want to hear critical race theory. But uh, anyway, uh, Frederick Douglass spoke and gave the speech several times, and then he continued to be a black leader after the Civil War. Now, <coughs> the idea of Independence Day, it's an idea, isn't it? It's, it's, you know, we celebrate it, but we're celebrating the Declaration of Independence when we said this country is going to be free of rule of the King of England. It's a symbol. Now, there's other symbols of freedom that black people recognize that maybe white people didn't, didn't look at it the same way. Other symbols of freedom, the federal eagle and the uniform. The symbols of the army were powerful, and Douglas understood this, and so did Buddy Bolden's eagle band. He didn't just choose eagle band because it sounded good. The eagle was on the brass button of the uniform. And all the other um, brass bands of the early uh, 20th century, the Excelsior, the Onward, and the Olympia bands understood it as well. This is what Douglas said about, about the uniform. Once let the black man get upon his person the brass letters, U.S., 
let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. And there is no power on earth or under the earth which can deny he has earned the rights of citizenship in the United States. So on July 9th, 1868, after the Civil War, the 14th Amendment was passed and four million freedmen were finally admitted to the Union. To these newly minted American citizens, the 4th of July now meant that they were officially part of the United States of America and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <coughs> so that's what, that's what um, Independence Day meant to the newly created American citizen. But what did Independence Day mean to New Orleans white society throughout Reconstruction and beyond? Joe Gray was a historian and professor of history at McNeese State University, and he wrote a very uh, clear and factual book uh, called Louisiana Reconstructed. <coughs> now, Dr. Taylor grew up in western, western Tennessee, which was where Nathaniel Bedford Forrest grew up. And so he had every reason to be prejudiced, but his book is wonderfully objective. And he says in his book, Independence Day, which had been a holiday of all before the war, became a freedman's holiday during Reconstruction. Whites might not work on the 4th of July, but it was blacks who held parades, picnics, and dances. Before the Civil War, white Americans celebrated Independence Day with feasts and parades and copious amounts of alcohol. It was almost the only holy day kept in America. But the Confederacy's defeat created economic and social hardship, and the day itself reminded many Southerners of bitter defeat. The Mississippi town of Vicksburg, which is only about four hours away from New Orleans, maybe five, fell to General Grant on July 4th, 1863. And the decisive Battle of Gettysburg ended on July 3rd of the same year. So in general, July 4th has, was not a welcome holiday in the South for white people. All right, but it was a black holiday. Black people celebrated it. In New Orleans, they celebrated it. They had parades in New Orleans. In Charleston, the very cradle, Charleston, South Carolina, the very cradle of the Confederacy, in 1885, the freedmen and women were dancing the Tulalu, which became synonymous with the black celebration of Independence Day. The Tulalu allowed ex-slaves to openly poke fun at the elite courtship rituals of their former masters while also engaging in a raucous celebration of their own emancipation. In 1876, 50 groups danced the Tulalu from early morning until midnight, but the white people stayed inside and said it was an N-word holiday. All right, so what happened between the Charleston's Tulalu big celebration in 1877 and July 4th, 1901, when Louis Armstrong was born. Well, on the national front, there was politics, all right? You may, anybody remember the Compromise of 1877? Well, you get an A plus, you get a gold star. I was a history teacher, and so. Uh, the Compromise of 1877, there were federal troops in the South, and the presidential election of that year was pretty much a tie. And uh, the Republicans said, if you let Rutherford B. Hayes be the president, we'll remove the last of the federal troops in the South. And guess where the federal troops were still remained? 
in the troublemaking states, I suppose. South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. In fact, Louisiana was the last state that they removed federal troops out of. Also, what's going on in the latter half between the Civil War and 1901? Westward expansion. There were 12 new states. It was also the early beginnings of the Great Migration, people moving from the rural areas into the bigger cities. This is probably when William Armstrong and May Ann Armstrong came to New Orleans. After the Civil War, there was the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that gave citizenship rights to the former slaves. They freed people of color and the Creole descendants of color, and Southern blacks could now own ownership of property. But also at the same time, white Confederates' voting rights were restored, and we began to see a gradual erosion of voting rights for black Americans in the South. And Plessy versus Ferguson, which actually that case, Plessy versus Ferguson was a Supreme Court case that came down in 1899, and that was started here in New Orleans, and it actually essentially backfired on the Creole people that tried to bring it to court, and the Supreme Court said, oh yes, yeah, separate but equal will be okay. All right, closer to home in Louisiana, what happened? In Louisiana in 1866, there was something called the New Orleans Massacre. There was the Opelousas Massacre in 1868. <coughs> <coughs> and there was the Colfax Massacre in 1873. Something about the Colfax ma Massacre, and I'm, I'm, I'm really embarrassed to say this, but my great-grandfather was one of the perpetrators in the Colfax Massacre. Colfax is up in Grant Parish. Uh, and my great-grandfather was actually put on trial, and, and the case went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that the federal government had no jurisdiction to be able to try my grandfather and a few others for the murder of black people. And for that, I'm deeply embarrassed, ashamed, and I apologize to all black people for my family's role in that. Uh, in addition to the Colfax Massacre, in, in 1873, there was the Thibodeau Massacre. And uh, I'm sorry, the Thibodeau Massacre is 1887. And here in New Orleans in 1900, there was something that was termed the Robert Charles Riot of 1900. What happened in the 1900 riot? A black activist, his name was Robert Charles, was visiting someone in an unfamiliar part of New Orleans, and he was aggressively manhandled by an intimidating policeman. Charles drew his revolver and fired, and he ultimately shot 27 people. But in response to this one man insurrection, 3,000 white people began three days of indiscriminate rioting, burning, beatings, and killings throughout the black neighborhoods of New Orleans. So, um, so th those kind of things were going on closer to New Orleans. So did William Armstrong know about these things? Did May Ann Armstrong know about these things? You, you know, they were ill-educated, but there was something that was termed the mysterious spiritual telegraph that was permeating through the black community, through the slave community during, war, during the Civil War. When Union Army troops went in and, and took over a territory, some of the slaves from the, new, the captured territory would come into the Union camps, and um, the Union soldiers would say, are more black people going to come into the camp? And somehow word got around that the Union soldiers were there and more would come in. So my point is that there was a method of communication among the black slaves that the white people didn't really know 
where, how they got how they got the message, but they got the message. So this slide here is uh, uh, from from the Colfax massacre. All right. So uh, what happened in 1898? Well. We had a war with Spain, and uh, it was in all the newspapers, and uh, everybody wanted a war in 1898. So there's nothing like a good war to stoke the fires of patriotism and nationalism. And that's when we start to see white people starting to celebrate the 4th of July, Independence Day, again. And by the time that Louis Armstrong was born, White New Orleans had fully embraced Independence Day. We fought a successful war against the Spanish. Nationalism prevailed even in the South. And it was now safe for white Southerners to be Americans again. And a seven-day front page headline proclaimed a great fourth in New Orleans and reported City Park was a scene of a glorious fourth City Park was the scene of a glorious fourth. It was a grand patriotic festival planned and executed on a different order from the usual Fourth of July celebrations. Now, racism and demeaning attitudes still pre prevailed in the newspapers. It was reported that one of the most popular attractions at the party was throwing the eggs, throwing rotten eggs at a black person's head. For five cents, customers could throw rotten eggs at a black person, and the Picayune editors wrote that, and they laughed off that humiliating spectacle as the foolish antics of the customary sideshow class. So, so black people had been celebrating the 4th of July. White people start embracing it again, and of course the prevailing attitudes of racism st were still there. They weren't going in, uh, uh, aware. They weren't going away. So May Ann Armstrong, Lewis's mother, maybe she was at that 4th of July celebration, and maybe she laughed at that black fool who was probably taunting people, hey, you can't hit me with, a, with an egg, into throwing, into throwing an egg at him. He probably made a little bit of money. But, but it was like, like and, and it's, but it is likely that she knew something of what the 4th of July meant to her and her parents who were born slaves. If nothing else, and here's what I think is what Lewis was doing, if nothing else, May Ann knew the 4th of July holiday rankled white folks, and she knew a massacre could occur at any moment. So who was Lewis Armstrong? By 10 years old, he's, he's a good kid. He had rudimentary education, and he could read the newspapers to the older folks in his neighborhood and the ones who helped Mama raise him. But at the same time, he's also a bad boy, and why not? He's pretty much on the streets running, running around doing whatever he wants. He has an absent father. So at nine years old, precocious Lewis, he's already selling newspapers, and he's shooting dice for pennies or playing a little coon and blackjack. And he's very aware of the sporting life. He once saw a knife fight before, between two prostitutes, and both of them died from their wounds. So that's not something you would let your kids go out and witness on the streets. So I'm more convinced than ever that Louis Armstrong knew what the 4th of July was all about and knew what it meant to his people and knew what knew that it irritated white people. After, I'm more convinced because I watched uh, the new documentary, Louis Armstrong's Black and Blues. You can get it on Apple TV. I watched it yesterday. And Justin Wilkes, who co-produced the documentary, said, race is the number one topic that Lewis is grappling with and con contemplating his entire life as a black man growing up in America in the 20th century. On one hand, he's literally the most famous and recognizable person in the world. And then at the same time, there are still hotels where he can't walk in the front door and restaurants that won't seat him because of the color of his skin. 
and he feels very strongly about this, but sometimes he tempers what he says publicly. So was Armstrong or his mother familiar with Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? Was that mysterious spiritual telegraph which runs through the slave population still operating among the descendants of the freedmen and communicating throughout New Orleans? Did they receive the message? You have un unalienable rights, and the 4th of July is your day to celebrate your citizenship. His mother and father were certainly aware of the Charles riot, though, for sure. Now, there was a big event that happened on the 4th of July in 1910. <coughs> and I, I submit that this 4th of July event played a very strong role in making Louis Armstrong aware of the power of July 4th. That was the day black America celebrated the victory of black heavyweight boxer Jack Johnson over Jim Jeffries, who was also known as the Great White Hope. And young Lewis was aware of Jack Johnson. In 1910, how was he aware? Well, he was delivering newspapers. He could read. In 1910, in the, lead, in the days leading up to the big fight, white New Orleans was obsessed with Jack Johnson. There were more than 200 daily Picayune stories mentioning him that year. And the Picayune sports writer, Mac McEnery's weekly column mentioned Johnson in nearly every edition. White America could not wait for Jim Jeffries to reclaim the boxing title that was thought to be the most prized possession in the trophy room of white supremacy. Now, writer Jack London, y'all all know Jack London. He wrote Call of the Wild, and he, well, he was a journalist, and he, he covered the fight for the newspaper syndicates, and the Picayune published his round-by-round -round account of the match. It was printed on the front page of the Picayune. London said that the thing that infuriated white boxing fans the most was Johnson's taunting verbal manter with his opponent and his ever-present smile. Quote, the carefree Negro smiled and smiled, and that is the story of the fight. Once again, has Johnson sent down to defeat the chosen representative of the white race, and this time the greatest of them. And as of old, it was play for Johnson. The fight today, and again I repeat, was only great in its significance. In itself, it was not great. Johnson played as usual with his opponent, not strong in the attack. Johnson blocking and defending in masterly fashion could afford to play, and he played and fought a white man in the white man's audience, and the audience was a Jeffrey's audience. Now, Louis Armstrong was bound to have read that stuff, and he was bound to have known of Jack Johnson. And this is what Louis Armstrong remembered of that 4th of July. I was scared. That day, I was going to get my supply of papers from Charlie. On Canal Street, I saw a crowd of colored boys running like mad toward me. I asked one of them what happened. You better get started, black boy. Jack Johnson has just knocked out Jim Jeffries. The white boys are sore about it, and they're going to take it out on us. Well, he didn't have to do any urging. I let out and passed the other boys in a flash. I was a fast runner, and when the other boys reached our neighborhood, I was at home looking calmly out the window. The next day, the excitement had blown over. So the next day, the excitement had blown over, but there were riots in nearly every major city in the country. Two in Louisiana were killed and three injured. In Fourth of July exuberance, alcohol, and the thrill of Johnson's victory obviously affected people's better judgment. One black man in New York was nearly lynched when he yelled to a crowd of white men, we blacks put one over on you whites, and we are going to do more to you. He had to be rescued by police. But Jack Johnson remained in the news throughout his heavyweight career and was undoubtedly a topic of conversation on the streets throughout New Orleans. 
And what did the victory mean to black people? Harlem Renaissance poet William Cooney wrote, my Lord, what a morning decades after the fight. Oh my Lord, what a morning. Oh my Lord, what a feeling. When Jack Johnson turned Jim Jeffries' snow white face up to the ceiling. So the 4th of July was a big day for Louis Armstrong. Uh, and Louis Armstrong knew, met Jack Johnson years later and was friends with him. And uh, he had, a, um, in my book, there's an autographed picture of Jack Johnson that he gave to Louis Armstrong. So what, what, what other stuff did Louis Armstrong know about race relations? Uh, <clears throat> there's evidence that Armstrong was aware of the things that needled white folks. As a performing te teenager in New Orleans, he knew all the popular songs of the day. Um, though Buddy Bolden was long gone from the music scene when Armstrong began performing, given Armstrong's wit, he must have heard and laughed at versions of Bob Buddy Bolden's Funky Butt song with the Mr. Lyrics Lincoln. New Orleans jazz chronicler Danny Barker said the lyrics included lines that obviously annoyed white folks. I thought I heard Mr. Lincoln say, Rebels close them plantations and let all them black folks out. You gonna lose this war, get on your knees and pray. That's the word I heard Mr. Lincoln say. So black people probably did not sing that too much in the presence of white folks because they know any wrong move could result in another riot, a massacre. But when they were among themselves, remember the hidden transcripts, this is, these are the we weapons of the weak. They probably sang it and had a good laugh. All right, other things that, uh, that uh, Louis Armstrong knew. He got his shots in whenever possible. In 1931, Louis was out in Chicago, came back to New Orleans after a nine-year break, and came and played at a place on the River Road called the Suburban Gardens for three months. And he was overheard on an open mic at the Suburban Gardens, saying that his baseball team, the Secret Nine, a pickup team that Lewis outfitted with new uniforms, that they would defeat the semi-pro team, the Black Pelicans, like Grant took Richmond. <coughs> the white announcer that was supposed to introduce him apparently heard Lewis say that, and he refused to announce Lewis Armstrong there. So Lewis got his little shots in. He knew what needled white people. <clears throat> but before that, before that, the, Lewis is an adult in 1931. When he was a child, he knew things. He saw things. He observed things. And this was written in his, in his papers, but it wasn't published until 1999. Uh, but Armstrong was fully aware of the hatred the old Confederate veterans had for blacks. But he waited late in his life to write down his feelings, and they weren't published till 99. At 10 years old, I could see the bluffings that that old, fat, belly-stinking, very smelly, dirty white folks were putting down. It seemed as though the only thing they cared about was their old-time shotguns, which they strapped around them. So they get full of their mint julep or their bad whiskey, that poor white trash were guzzling down like water, and then they get so damn drunk that they'd go out of their minds, and then it's black person hunting time, any black person. They wouldn't give up until they would find one. From then on, Lord have mercy on the poor black man. Then they would torture the poor black man, as innocent as he may be, they would get their usual ignorant chess cat laughs before they would shoot him down like a dog. My, 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 those were the days. So did Louis Armstrong know the 4th of July was a black holiday? It seemed obvious. He also knew it was the day Jack Johnson turned Jim Jeffrey's snow white face up to the ceiling, and he knew white Southerners were sensitive about their defeat in the Civil War. 
and he participated in small protests. He wrote, there's something funny about those for colored passengers only signs on the streetcars in New Orleans. We colored folks used to get a real kick out of them when we got on a car at the picnic grounds or at the Ca Canal Street on Sunday when we outnumbered the white folks. Automatically, we took the whole car over, sitting as far up front as we wanted to. It felt good to sit up there once in a while. We felt a little more important than usual. I can't explain why exactly, but maybe it was because we weren't supposed to be there. So in 1875, the 4th of July was a black holiday. By 1901, white people felt it was safe to celebrate Independence Day again. Reconstruction, forgotten. Jim Crow was cranking up. World War II, the civil rights struggle, Vietnam, Cold War, Reaganism, Clinton, 9-11, Obama, Black Lives Matter, and Trump are a long way from the Emancipation Proclamation. By the time of Louis Armstrong's 100th birthday, there was little emotional knowledge that remained of what Independence Day meant to a freed man. But small things lingered. New Orleans instinctively kept the meaning of Armstrong's Independence Day fire burning, even if they never gave a thought to what the day meant to Satchmo or his mother or his grandfather. Concerts in New Orleans, Jackson Square, honoring Armstrong's 4th of July birthday began after his death in 1975 until 1986, when the New Orleans Recreation Department ran out of event money. And even though Tad Jones announced his bombshell birthday discovery in 1988, public recognition of Armstrong's birthday continued the focus on the 4th. Birthday concerts resumed in Armstrong Park in 1987 and 88, and in 2000, Wynton Marsalis and Leroy Jones raised their horns in tribute to Satchmo's purported birthday. But there were no public large public celebrations until the city honored Satchmo by renaming the airport Louis Armstrong New Orleans International Airport in 2001. Then the state of Louisiana's Department of Cultural Recreation and Tourism decisively recognized the August 4th birth date when it created the Satchmo Summerfest at the old U.S. Mint in the French Quarter. And Bruce and Pic our Picayune writer Bruce Egler suggested that the state got behind the festival because it had come under fire for doing too little to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the day Louis Armstrong claimed as his birthday. <clears throat> so the state had interest in promoting a, a late summer festival. The Department of Culture, Recreation, Tourism had assisted Ken Burns with his jazz documentary. A new audience got, got a glimpse of how Armstrong changed American music. And coincidentally, on August 4, 2001, the date meshed with a previously planned University of New Orleans fundraiser concert featuring the Marsalis family and Harry Connick Jr. And a symposium on Armstrong and jazz was also being planned at the school. So it was easy to piggyback the three events and the summer Satchmo Fest was born. And so it was now official with state recognition. Louis Armstrong was born on August 4th, 2001. So, 2001, the state gets involved, it's official. But Louis Armstrong continued to celebrate his birthday on July 4th throughout his life. And Greg Stafford, who is a great trumpet player here in town, he didn't like it. He, he, he's, he was upset, and he was quoted to Offbeat Magazine. My feeling is that people tend to dwell in the social lives of black people and sometimes don't understand the way black people live. I, I think Greg understood, but he was having trouble feeling it. I mean, not feeling it, he felt it. He knew, he must have known what Independence Day meant to black people. It carried over for 100 years. Independence Day means something different to black people, especially um, 
in 1900. So uh, Kermit Ruffins, the trumpet player, took a diplomatic approach, and he said, I think Armstrong has always been one of the most blessed men in the world, so maybe he should have two birthdays, he said. And Wynton Marsalis, for years, had unappreciated, uh, underappreciated Armstrong, but eventually, and I think this is significant, we, we all believe our country is great, and, and some of us believe it can do no wrong, and some of us believe it can do wrong, but we still love our country, and we're patriots, and, um, but we sometimes fail to live up to those lofty ideals written in our documents, especially the Declaration of Independence. But, Louis, but Wynton Marsalis said, Pops personified the sound of America and the freedom that it is supposed to represent. So more than 100 years after the birth of Mayan's gifted son, can 21st century Americans fully understand what Independence Day meant to her generation? What did the Declaration mean to an American revolutionary in 1776? What did the Declaration of Independence mean to a freed man of 1876, and what did it mean to a black musical genius born in 1901? Ultimately, was Louis Armstrong protesting the social order by it insisting his birthday was on the 4th of July, or was he just appreciating the preciousness of his American citizenship? I know what I think. What do you think? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Sam Irwin. If you need a syllabus, uh, Ken Burns, who you mentioned, made a fine film called Unforgivable Blackness about Jack Johnson. And uh, there's a great book called Carnival of Fury about Robert Charles. And everyone should read What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. Anyway, once again, a big hand for Sam Irwin. There are two copies of his book downstairs. Uh, and one across the street, the Louisiana Music Factory. Um, so pick one of those up. And, um, and he has some in his truck. So um, <laughs>